It all started with the home insurance building that was built in 1885 in Chicago. Just a 10-story building, but it was a revolution at the time. And that was the beginning of the era of skyscrapers. It was constructed using a revolutionary method. The building had an inner skeleton made of steel, which allowed the walls to be thinner and the whole structure being higher than ever. It stood until 1931, when it was demolished to build the Bank of America that stands even today. That very same year, the construction of the Empire State Building in New York was completed. The Empire State is as tall as 10 home insurance buildings on top of one another. That's the construction progress humanity made in just 46 years. The Empire State became the tallest construction in the world and held that status for 39 years. Now, a bit more than a half century later, the Empire State Building is ranked 53 on the list of the tallest constructions. Humanity has climbed way higher. The tallest building in the world today is Burj Khalifa, located in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. It's 2,717 feet tall, more than two Empire State Buildings on top of one another. Even though skyscrapers started out in the United States, they became tremendously popular in Asia. Just to put it in perspective, around 80% of the skyscrapers that exist in the world are in Asia. And in total, the continent has over 7,500 skyscrapers. The country with the most skyscrapers is China, having almost 3,000 of them. Why do they like skyscrapers so much? Well, Asia has the largest population in the world and their economy is booming. So, growing high is a perfect solution to fit as many people as possible in its cities. But close to China, there's also India, having almost the same population. Still, they have 10 times fewer skyscrapers, with their number being a bit over 200, and most of them being located in Mumbai. So why doesn't India build skyscrapers if it's such a great way to accommodate people? Turns out, the country strictly regulates the construction, saying that it's due to health and safety. You see, there's quite a popular urban theory that big structures that accommodate a lot of people lead to higher population density, more anonymity in the city, and lower safety in the territory. So India is trying to avoid it by building low. Problem is that when a city can't accommodate everyone who wants to live there, the cities start growing horizontally. One more thing is that the land and the apartments are very expensive due to their scarcity, so very few people can afford it. This way, India has started to loosen the restrictions recently and is now slowly allowing to build a bit higher. 34 skyscrapers are now under construction. Do you know what other place in the world refuses to build skyscrapers too? Europe. New York alone has more skyscrapers than all of Europe combined. There are just 250 skyscrapers in Europe, and half of them are in just three cities. Europe has a whole different reason to resist tall buildings. The history of skyscrapers goes back to just a bit over 100 years ago, to the 20th century USA. The USA is quite a young country, and the cities are still being built from scratch. There is a lot of available land. When the United States were being built, many European cities had already been around for dozens of centuries. There's not much more room for construction, and no one has any desire to take down the Colosseum and put some fancy skyscraper there instead. There was also no practical reason for changing things. The driving force of Asian and American skyscrapers is the booming population of the cities. Also, Europeans are very protective of their city skylines. The story comes to Brussels, the capital of Belgium, which even got the term Brusselization. In the 1960s, there were no zoning regulations and some buildings in Brussels were demolished to make room for more modern buildings to develop business districts. Uncontrollable construction started, and modern buildings were built in random places around Brussels. 
They had no cultural or historical value, and they didn't fit in the city architecture at all, messing up the city's image. Many architects and people protested, and new laws were introduced, restricting the demolition of buildings of historical importance and taking construction under control. Other European countries learned from Belgium's mistakes. Populations across Europe still dislike modern structures. Many cities adopted zoning regulations and building a fancy glass skyscraper in Europe isn't that easy. Still, cities with big financial centers like London, Frankfurt, or Istanbul require commercial space. So, in some cities, there are several skyscrapers somewhere outside the historic centers, forming separate skyscraper districts. Rome, the capital of Italy and one of the oldest cities in the world, rejected skyscrapers completely, stating that no high-rise will ever appear there. Also, have you noticed that most skyscrapers are made of glass? Turns out, the choice is not random at all, and there are several reasons to favor glass in their construction. The first one is that glass can be pressed in every shape possible, so the skyscraper can no longer be just a plain, boring vertical tower as before. But all of these fancy designs we have around the world now. The second reason is that glass is a very thin material. The walls are thinner and the floors are bigger, providing more inner space, unlike in the pre-home insurance building times. Glass is also transparent. Glass reduces the need for electrical lighting inside the building, so it's also very cost-effective. Even more, glass is temperature and therefore weather-resistant. And finally, it just looks posh, fancy, and modern. So, Theoretically, skyscrapers maximize urban space, accommodate more people, and reduce energy use. In practice, everything is a bit less efficient. Skyscrapers have more space between them than lower buildings, so that already means more land used than we imagined. Also, around 40% of a skyscraper's floor space isn't... You're driving along a deserted road. There are lifeless fields on the sides and high mountains in front. You stop near a yellow sign. It says, the phenomenon that defies gravity. You go a little further, drive uphill and stop the car. A strange anomaly occurs right there. You release the gas pedal, turn off the engine and take your hands off the steering wheel. Your car is moving up. You get out of the vehicle and see it from the side. The road rises, and the car rolls further as if the road goes down. You can put a bowling ball, and it will also move against the laws of physics. This place is called Magnetic Hill. It's located 18 miles from the Indian city of Leh. Every year, thousands of tourists come here to enjoy the picturesque mountain landscape and see the unusual phenomenon with their own eyes. There are many legends around this place. Locals believe this road leads to the sky. It draws good people up, and the bad ones get confused and can't find a way to reach the sky. Scientists have a different possible explanation. This hill has a strong magnetic force coming out deep from the ground. It's so powerful that planes flying over this place encounter interference with their navigational devices. Also, many travelers from all over the world reported GPS and compass failures. There may be a source of magnetic force here, but this theory has never been proven. Magnetic Hill is a powerful optical illusion. You think the road's going up, but it's going down. The shape of the surrounding landscape and the mountain horizon change the perception of the road and create an optical illusion. To see the next natural optical illusion, you need to get on a ship and go far away from the shore. You're in the middle of the sea, the sky and sea are divided by a straight line of water. There are no clouds and the sun goes down. You're watching a beautiful sunset and see a bright green flash. It seems as if the sun has turned green, but the effect disappears after two seconds and you see the orange-red light again. You can also observe the green flash at sunrise. This natural phenomenon happens when light passes through the atmosphere at a certain angle. The atmosphere bends the shape of the sun's rays and separates them into different colors.
combinations of these colors look like a green flash. There are several varieties of green flash, and the rarest one is green ray. Immediately after the sun sets over the horizon, a green ray of light releases into the sky. You can observe it when the green flash mixes with foggy air. The next illusion is located in the swamps. It's night. You're driving along a highway between two British cities. The moon is shining brightly, and you're driving off the road to a swampy area. Then you get out of the car and look at the dark green waters. There's no one around except croaking frogs. At this moment, strange orange lights appear in the air. It hangs right over the swamp and flies in different directions. It's like somebody's trying to light your way with a kerosene lamp. For centuries, people have observed this phenomenon and called it fool's fire or spook lights. Previously, people thought that somebody who was in trouble lit a torch to call for help. People walked towards the light and got into swamp traps. Today, science can explain the nature of phantom lights. Bioluminescent fungi and algae grow in swampy places and sometimes glow with a blue color. From a distance, this creates an illusion of little lights. The wind and water shake the algae and it seems like the lights are flying. Also, there is a lot of plant material in the swamps. Leaves, grass, mud, clay, tree branches. This stuff decomposes quickly in damp conditions and releases methane. When methane contacts the air, it ignites and flies over the swamp in the form of a burning ball. This phenomenon is observed all over the world in swampy areas, but the most famous flying lights are located in the desert of West Texas. It's called Marfa Lights. A lot of people saw lights the size of a basketball flying over the desert. They have yellow, blue, and red shades. The lights flicker, merge, divide into two parts, fly high. You can see them several times a year under different weather conditions. There's no exact scientific explanation for Marfa lights, but one of the theories says it's the headlights of cars passing on a neighboring highway. The heated air and the desolate flat terrain create the effect of flying balloons. It could also happen when cold air gets over warm air and light passes through them. Many people think Marfa lights appear for the same reason as the lights in British swamps. There are huge reserves of oil and natural gas, including methane, in Texas. It comes out of the ground and fires up. You arrive in sunny California and stop the car at the foot of the Santa Lucia Mountains. Here, you feel as if someone's watching you, but there's no people around. You raise your head and look at the mountains. There are silhouettes of huge people on the peaks. They are three to four times larger than an ordinary person and they seem to be wearing raincoats and hats. They just look at you, and you feel their heavy gaze. You sweat and want to run away, but your legs don't listen to you. After a few seconds, the giants disappear. You get in the car and drive out of this place as quickly as possible. This phenomenon is called Dark Watchers. People first noticed it more than 300 years ago, but still, no one can explain its nature. The most common hypothesis says that the clouds create shadows that fall on the rocks. The human brain draws an image of giants from these shadows. This may be a mind deception. For many years, people have been telling each other about the Watchers, so everyone sees what they believe in. Our next stop is Nashville, Indiana. There's a hotel here built in the 19th century. The building is well preserved to this day and still welcomes guests. The name of the hotel is The Story Inn. There are 18 rooms and each of them has a unique history and is made in a different style. The hotel preserves the atmosphere of the 19th century, so you won't find a lot of modern technologies here. You book a room, go up to the desired floor and open the door. The room looks old, but cozy and neat. You put your things down and notice an old book on the table. As soon as you open it, your eyes widen. Each page tells about the paranormal activity that occurs in this hotel. You read in detail about each specific strange case that happened in hotel rooms. Behind each door, you can encounter different creepy things. The book contains dates and a detailed description of each strange case. It looks like a report or an administrator's journal. 
These books had already been here when the current hotel owner bought this building. The owner decided to keep them to attract tourists, and it worked. Fans of weird things often stay at the Story Inn. The most popular story among guests and employees is the story of the Blue Lady. Many people believe that if you light up a room with blue color, the lady will appear. She has blue eyes and leaves blue objects in the room. Sometimes, it appears just like that, in the light of day or at night. Of course, that's all legends. But you go to the nearest store and buy a transparent plastic cover for the table lamp. You come to the room, turn off the light, and wrap the lamp with the cover. Then, you draw the curtains and click on the switch. You still don't remember exactly what happened that day at the hotel, but you'll never forget those blue eyes. You're standing on the red carpet, waiting for the train to come. The Maharajas Express is India's most expensive and luxurious train ride. It's heavy on the wallet, too. The prices can range from $2,900 to a whopping $23,000. This multi-award winning train has a bunch of extravagant rooms to pick from. It also passes through more than 10 different cities in India. The train finally arrives and you board it. You're accompanied by many friendly staff members that help you with your luggage. They show you in and give you a quick tour of the amenities before leading you to your room. Like every other room, yours has a butler to fulfill any of your requests. The deluxe cabin has a luxury and cozy interior with international safety features. Among them, there are smoke detectors and security cams. The suspension system underneath the railroad car smooths all the bumps, letting you relax completely. You enter a 112-square-foot cabin to take a look. The first thing you see is a king-sized bed with high-end bed sheets. It seems to be inviting you to come and take a nap. You have a closet for all your stuff and a large LCD television with a DVD player. But don't worry, there's Wi-Fi as well. There's also a personalized safe to keep your things and documents. Inside the cabin, there's a bathroom with a shower cubicle and hot and cold running water. It's equipped with a hairdryer and even has such toiletries as essential oils. There's probably no need to mention that the bathroom has bath slippers, a bathrobe, and several towels that can always be washed upon request. After going around the cabin, you decide to check the other rooms they offer. The train has 20 of these deluxe cabins, 12 of which have twin beds and eight king-size beds. There are plenty of staff members for all the passengers so that you won't feel underserved. You move on to the junior suite and notice that it's bigger than the deluxe suite. This one is 150 square feet and offers the same luxuries as the previous one. All these suites come with air conditioning and a direct interphone to contact any staff member. After you've taken a look around, the butler escorts you to the suite. He opens the door for you and you immediately feel as if you've set foot in a royal palace. The suite is way bigger than the other two cabins. Its size is 220 square feet, and it even has a separate living room. There are four of such rooms on the train, and they all come with king-size beds and large panoramic windows to enjoy amazing views. You go inside for a room tour. The cabin has the same features as the others, but the living room has armchairs with side tables to do some reading or work on your laptop. The suite also has a mini fridge equipped with complimentary tea, coffee, water and snacks. The bathroom has a bathtub to relax or even take a nap in. You're sold. You're ready to unpack and dip in that bathtub. But that's when the butler tells you there's an even bigger cabin. You stop gawking at the walls and ceiling and follow him to the presidential suite. There's just one such suite on the train. The butler opens the door for you and wow. This 450-square-foot mini-palace is the most luxurious train cabin in all of India and one of the best in Asia. It has the same features as the other cabins, but you can't take your eyes off that beautifully decorated ceiling in spacious design that makes you feel like royalty. The presidential suite is named Navaratana. It means nine precious gems. It has two bedrooms, a bathroom and a living room. One bedroom has a king-sized bed and the other has twin beds. The living room is furnished with a sofa where you can read a book or relax and a table for writing. This suite comes with a personal guide and a luxury car that takes you around whenever the train makes a stop. You put your bags down and sign up for the presidential suite. It's the most expensive cabin on the train, 
$23,000. The train starts moving after everyone has boarded. You inform the butler that you don't want to be disturbed and ask him to remind you for breakfast at 8 a.m. For now, you lie down on your bed and look out the window at the magnificent views of India. It's 8 a.m., and the butler tells you it's time to go to the restaurant. You leave your cabin, and the staff members greet and welcome you. You walk over to one of the restaurants called Mayor Mahal, which means peacock. It's the national bird of India. You're seated by the window and given a menu. You can choose between international and Indian cuisine. The waiters are on standby, ready to offer you their services. By the way, in case an emergency happens, there's always a team of paramedics prepared to act quickly. The Maharajas Express offers four unique journeys to take. The Indian Panorama, the Indian Splendor Journey, the Heritage of India, and the Treasures of India. Altogether, the trips can take you to 12 different destinations. You pick the Indian Panorama, which is a six-night and seven-day-long tour that begins in Delhi and ends in Mumbai. After breakfast, you head back to your presidential suite and switch on a movie while eating some yummy snacks. The train leaves Delhi and arrives in Jaipur several hours later. After a quick briefing and lunch, everyone heads down to the city to do some sightseeing. The guide takes you and a bunch of other people to visit the city palace galleries and later to have dinner at the Ram Bagh Palace Hotel. The next day, you can either opt for another tour or have a spa day at the hotel. You arrive in Ranthambar and have a tour around the national park. You come across tigers and other wild animals. After that, you take other tours, including a trip to deserted city Mughal city of Fatehpur, Sikiri. You head back to the train after a long day and decide to visit the lounge. The Raja Club has comfortable seats with an amazing view of the world outside. You pick a seat, order a drink, and start chatting with other passengers. You even find a fun board game to unleash your competitive side. After a while, some people go back to their cabins. The next day, you wake up in Agra, the city of the Taj Mahal. It's considered to be one of the wonders of the world. Your eyes start gleaming at the sight of it. Everyone gathers around to take pictures with a colossal white marble construction in the background. After that, you can visit more historic sites or have another spa day at the hotel. You pick the second option. It's a one-of-a-kind mm. experience. You're almost all the way through the trip, but not before you arrive at Orca and hop on a tuk-tuk to explore the city. Then it's day six, and you're in Varanasi and go see the Sarnath ruins, followed by a visit to the Silk Weaving Center. It's quite hot, so you take a boat ride on the magical Ganges River. You're impressed by the amazing scenery. And in the evening, you experience an exclusive vegetarian dinner at the Bridge Ram Palace. You head back to the train together with everyone else. This is the last night you'll spend there before going back home the next day. You've made lots of friends and seen some of the most unique places in the world. You take part in a lavish party at the restaurant where all the guests and staff enjoy themselves. You wake up the next day in your presidential suite, knowing you'll leave it by 3 p.m. The train is heading back to Delhi. You ask your butler to bring in some breakfast since you feel like treating yourself today. And after packing all your stuff, you head to the restaurant to have some lunch with everyone else. You arrive in Delhi with all your bags packed and ready to roll. The train stops and everyone exits. This magnificent trip has eventually come to its end. And even though it was a very expensive journey, deep inside, you know you'll be back to discover more of India.